I am the daughter of two amazing and beautiful, loving immigrant souls, Mario and Rosie. I grew up 15 minutes walking distance from the US-Mexican border. And I was like, mother, you could have walked and my life would have been so different, but she didn't and I still love her. And I remember being in the fifth grade classroom at the age of 10. My mom came into the, into the classroom. I went to a Catholic school, so I was terrified. I was calling to the nun's office. And all I remember was being so worried because I had never been called into the office. And I walked in, and my mom just looked at me and said, Reina, go get your backpack. It's time to go. That was the last time that I got to see my friends, my teachers, and people that I care about. At that moment, I ended up building a lot of resentment. And we ended up going to another border city, Nogales, Sonora, which is three hours south where I grew up and where I call home now in Mesa, Arizona. And during three years, I live in the in-between, back and forth, and going from Nogales to Chandler, Arizona to visit my dad because he had already migrated to the United States. And at that moment, I was confused. I didn't know what was going on. We finally migrated after my dad purchased a home. And I remember being in, in the eighth grade classroom. I didn't know a word of English. I felt that everything that I have built was taken away, that I was a little social butterfly as a little kid. I was doing really well in grades. And as soon as I came into the eighth grade classroom, I just couldn't speak. And I was paralyzed. And at that moment, I felt that I had to prove people wrong. I felt that people were valuing who I was because I couldn't speak a language. And yet, I was like, I'm going to prove them wrong, and I'm going to do the best that I can. And I learned English pretty fast, and I was pretty much able to join the mainstream English language classes. But at that moment, I remember feeling shame and being so mad at my parents for bringing me to a place that I didn't like and that I didn't belong. Later on, as I was telling you, I learned English, everything was smooth, and I was in high school. And like any other high school student, I was had to come up with your 10-year plan. I was the planner, I had my life completely figured out at the age of 17. I was gonna graduate Mesquite High School, I was gonna go to Arizona State University because it had three Starbucks, and we know that that's cool. Then I was going to graduate and go and work at the United, Nature, uh, United Nations. And then, little did I know, that not having a social security number was going to be the biggest impediment for me to not be able to start my 10-year plan. And at that moment, I became so angry. I was so angry because it didn't matter that I had a 4.0. It didn't matter that I was involved in my community because at the end of the day, I was being judged by a nine-digit number. Luckily, I made it to ASU. My plan didn't really work out so well, but I was able to find my voice again. When I was 19, I became a student organizer. And I don't know if you know, but in Arizona, there was something called SB 1070, which it was a show me your papers law. So if you were a little too dark, you could be pulled over and people would have to ask you for your immigration status. And at that moment, I remember going to church and people in my congregation would start saying that SB 1070 was a good thing, that Sheriff Yo Arpaio was doing the right thing, and I was just having all these conflicts. I'm like, you're supposed to be there for people. You're not supposed to judge. You're supposed to follow Jesus Christ's steps, and yet you want me out? And that's when I had enough, and I decided to use my voice again, and 19-year-old Reina was, this is enough, and this is who I am. So when you're talking about undocumented people, when you're talking about undocumented immigrants, you're talking about me. And as I mentioned, um, I became a student organizer at ASU, and I started meeting other people like me. In Arizona, you might think that it's a very diverse 
place, depending who you ask, but I went to a predominantly Anglo or white high school. So it wasn't until I got to college that I really got to meet people that were in my same shoes. And I got to see in their faces all the fear that they had for being worried that by driving to go to school, it meant that they could automatically be put in deportation proceedings. And I got to witness that. But I also got to witness the beautiful power that it has to be working with community and being able to find your own voice. And big day came in, graduation. And I don't know how many of you remember or have had the privilege to graduate, but everybody has balloons, there's a lot of celebration, a lot of joy. And I want you to take a moment to look at my facial expression. Because I'm smiling, but yet I'm looking down. And I remember looking down at that moment because I still was undocumented. I still knew that walking away from that stage, it didn't matter that I was being recognized as the most outstanding undergraduate student, that I was able to persevere and get two majors in political science and immigration and economy policy and a minor in dance. It'll make sense later, I promise. But I was that student taking 21 credits and still it wasn't good enough. So imagine growing up with a continuously message saying that it doesn't matter what you do, it's never good enough. So anxiety, stress, and that sense of not being good enough were too real, were too palpable, were too common. Yet, something that you don't see in this picture is that my parents, we're over there in the bleachers. And I remember still until this day, they had the biggest smiles in their faces. And at that moment, I knew that it didn't matter that I didn't have a social security because I had made my mission. I had accomplished my mission of making my parents proud. And nobody, no politician could take that away from me at that moment. Then, a year later, Mario, my dad, my rock, the person who has sacrificed everything, was detained one year after I graduated. At that moment, fear, anxiety, and uncertainty were once again feelings that were too common. And at that moment, remember that I told you that I was a student organizer? I knew exactly the checklist. I need to get an attorney, make sure that I didn't get a notario so we wouldn't get ripped off. I knew how to organize a press conference. I knew how to mobilize my community. Yet, I didn't know how to take care of myself. And I didn't prepare to be faced to not spend birthdays, Christmas, or important days around my dad. And during those times, during nine months, I had to be separated from him. I had to look into my little sister's eyes. I had to look into my brother's eyes and tell them that, I'm sorry, kids, I don't know if daddy's going to come home. And during those very challenging moments, I had other community leaders who said, you can't fight for your dad. He's not the good immigrant. He's not the person who's going to get out. So I had to take a leap of faith, and I had to follow my heart. So dance, I told you it would make sense. Dance became my refuge. And it was the way that I was able to cope with my own anxiety and stress. And after months of feeling depressed, feeling that I wasn't sure about what was going to happen, I was able to fight my father's deportation. And after nine months, my dad got released, and he was able to be reunited with my family. And at that moment, I don't know if you remember that I said that there were leaders who didn't really want to do the right thing. So then I became the solution with the movement. And I was like, screw this. I was becoming too jaded. I wasn't becoming the person that I wanted to be. So I left. And I went into the classroom. And I was like, there's so many ways that I can continue to serve. So years passed. And I continued to be a public servant through education. And I taught at a 98% Latino school where my students were experiencing very similar stories like me. And at that moment, I just became so conflicted 
conflicted and I knew I needed to act. I knew that I couldn't just remain in the classroom and I needed to do something. So at that moment, I decided to find Aliento because I know that I could either continue to have criticisms, I knew I can continue to witness my community being challenged, but at the same time, I knew that I was seeing something that many people weren't seeing. I was seeing a migrant community who was filled of joy, that was resilient, and that was ready to contribute. So at that moment, I founded Aliento for those of you who do not speak Spanish, aliento translates into breath, but when you give aliento, it's like giving words of encouragement. So in that, we have been able to use art as a medium for us to heal. I have had the privilege to work with little kids at the age of seven all the way to adults that are using art as a form of transforming their own traumas, their own fears into hope and action. And you have to start home. So remember about my little sister, that's Angie. And Angie was able to draw a picture of a painting about a world with and without her dad. And with that, she came into Mesa Public School Districts to testify and tell her school board that this didn't have to be this way and that they needed to create policies to ensure that children were not living in fear so they could be with their parents. I got to meet Maria, who's a DACA recipient, who was feeling so isolated and hopeless, but yet she has been able to find her own voice through arts and healing and come to the state capitol to advocate for her higher education. I have met these beautiful, young and bright fellows, Maria, Deya, Germán, Yvette, and Angelica, who have pretty much utilize their leadership skills into action, where they have led 230 students from 19 different schools in Arizona, and because they know that they're no longer gonna let other organizations use their stories, but they have to be equipped with the skills to be agents of change themselves and be their own CEOs of their stories. And they have been able to pass that along, and they have been building and organizing other leaders like Karen, who's an undocumented student in Arizona. And at the end of the day, this is what it's about. It's about taking that moment to seeing each other eye to eye and see the humanity that it comes beyond papers. And as I reflect on my own very journey of transforming my own traumas, into hope and action, I think of my parents. I think of the parents of Deya that have inspired her to be a better person. And I think of mommy and papi, because they have always instilled in me the belief that I was equal to any other person, regardless of class, creed, ethnicity, or gender. Now I know that my immigration status doesn't define me. However, it has ripped away many opportunities from me and many other people I care about. But at the end of the day, we all have to remember that our inner light, our hope, and dreams cannot be diminished. That our hope in humanity goes beyond any man-made borders. And that our light must be grounded in our daily actions and not in institutions that are not willing to live up to their values. And because we are here today, it's a reminder that we can continue to carry on. So I ask you to breathe with me. If you have ever felt alone, if you have felt that you're never good enough, or you have felt that people don't understand you, I ask you to take a deep breath with me. Inhale, exhale. Let's do that again. Inhale, exhale. And if you're washing, Let's remember that breathing makes us human. Inhale, let it out. <sighs> we are beings of light. We are beings of hope. We are beings of energy. Let's never forget to see each other eye to eye and see our shared humanity. In La Quesh, tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. I am Reina Montoya, and I am so humbled to be walking in this journey with you seeking to understand others, seeking to see in each other our humanity. And I hope that when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling alone, no matter where you come from, feel your heart, hear the noise, and know that you're alive.
Thank you.